Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway. Funding has been provided by New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. JAG Physical Therapy, Georgian Court University, Valley National Bank, Verizon, and by Fedway Associates. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by Observer New Jersey Politics. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJ TV studio in beautiful Newark, New Jersey. We're pleased to welcome one of the most prominent members of the state legislature, State Senator Teresa Rize, Democrat, who happens to be the assistant majority leader and chair of the Senate Education Committee. Good to see you, Senator. Thank you for having me. One of the issues that you have been a leader on, and a whole range of education issues, but one of the ones that we're involved in right now as part of an initiative uh, called Right from the Start, NJ. It's a public awareness initiative dealing with infants and babies and their needs, and you know this professionally and personally. That's right. So my career trajectory started me inside of a, a daycare classroom. I think you know the story. And that's the first time I really learned the impact uh, that a teacher can have in a child's life. I was fortunate enough to share an academic year with four-year-olds, and you can see the potential that they have. It was my inability to expose them to much greater things that really prevented them from learning more. And so when I got into the legislature, my focus was education and a real fine-tuned lens on early childhood. The state of New Jersey has a phenomenal early childhood program, but what we have lacked in is expanding those programs and really thinking about pre-three-year-olds, what happens from uh, you know, prenatal care to three before we get them inside of a classroom what setting. What's so, going on then for those babies? So, so what is happening as a mother? And before they're born. Exactly. As a, a, a new mother, my daughter will be one in, in the next couple of weeks. She was being exposed to music. I was reading to her every single day while she was in the belly. And I truly believe that it has a great impact. Science has indicated that already. There are neuroscientists that come out and explain to you that a child's brain is malleable plastic. And if we get an opportunity to mold that, to expose it, to have them express in different ways, the opportunities that we have to really creating a phenomenal human being is extraordinary. But that also requires that the mother has access to high quality health care, that she has quality to career programs, that she is in an environment that's safe and secure, and that she has a career pathway herself. And so it's a a huge, uh, full, hands-on-deck approach, uh, depending on many different departments. I'm hoping that within the next administration, I'll be able to pass a piece of legislation that creates the Department of Early Childhood that really lends itself to bringing in all the pieces together so it's a one-stop stop hub that really focuses on zero to five. That's so interesting because, well, by the way, we'll also be joined as part of the series by the chair of the Senate Health Committee, uh, who you know very well, Senator Joseph Vitale, will be talking about this. Um, but I'm curious about this. How much of this, Senator, has to do with money? We were talking to Cecilia Zalkine for Advocates for Children of New Jersey, and she brought up the issue of reimbursement for women or families, but particularly moms who are involved in childcare, don't have the dollars. Is the state have a role there? Of course we do. So the thing is to look at it twofold. When we think about early child care right now, I think you can talk to a mother in Cherry Hill and you can talk to a mother in Irvington and you're going to hear the exact same issues. Do we have access to the resources to put them in, right. a, in, in a full day program? What kind of programs are available? Do I have the ability to take them to and from school? And so it might come from different dynamics, but it's still kind of the same issue. We are in a state that has, for the most part, two work 
working parents in the household mm. or a single head of household. And so child care is a really prominent thing. And it becomes a decision whether you send them into a private uh, facility that you can afford to pay or do you have a program <coughs> that's afforded to you that's high quality or do you keep them at home with a relative because that's the most cost effective? We can't be short-sighted in that. So for every dollar that we invest in early childhood programs, there is a range. The average is you get $15 back for every single dollar. 15 back? 15 back. There is a range. And it's it's uh, cost savings, reductions in 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 schools when the child has uh, you know opportunities to grow out of uh, deficiencies that he or she may have a pathway to a higher earning, mm. a pathway away from the prison pa pipeline, and a pathway from reduction on uh, leaning themselves this on resources of the you. government. Of course it is. So I see at home the ability that I have had to really work with my daughter. I've seen it in the classroom. I've as seen a teacher. as a teacher, I've seen the research based mechanism. It is short sighted mm -hmm. on behalf of levels of government to think that making an investment in a child is an expenditure. It's truly a cost saving measure. It's a life saving measure. Speaking of life saving, there's no natural segue for this, but um, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, we will also work with the Sharing Network of New Jersey, uh, organ and tissue donation organization. Um, there are thousands of people waiting, right, to just have their lives saved because there's, there's an organ that's not working in their body. You know this issue, again, personally, and I've been a leader in it. Talk about organ and tissue donation and why it's so important, because there are so many that are, people are just waiting. So it's, it's the most uh, intimate important thing that a person, a human being, can lend themselves to. Oftentimes you think that your time on earth will measure what you've done and who you are. And um, my dad was an extraordinary human being that touched the lives of so many people and helped them in so many ways. And he oftentimes would kid because he had diabetes, et cetera, and would say, you know, I'm an or organ donor, but who's going to want any one of these used parts? They're not going to be good for anything. And he was so wrong. Uh, he lives on in two people, um, someone who's reached out to our family who really got a second chance at life because was part of the gift of sharing. And it's an extraordinary thing. If you have the opportunity to do it, we should all check that box on our uh, li driver's licenses or, or leave, you know, detailed information as to what you want happen. You can give back way after in ways that you can never imagine. Before I let you go, <clears throat> we've known each other a few years. We've had a lot of offline conversations. And one of the things that strikes me is your optimism about being able to solve our problems in spite of what appears to be going on in Washington and State House, the gridlock. Why do you remain optimistic? I have to remain optimistic. When you think about the future mm -hmm. of this country and this state, the only way that we're really going to turn the corner is making sure that we keep the eye on the prize. And for me, that's the next generation of leaders. It's children. It's making those investments. We saw it in this last budget cycle. We were able to put in over $100 million into the school funding formula. 25 of that went into early childhood expansion. And we just need to keep the bar moving back, back, back until mm. we get to a finish line that moves every child in the state of New Jersey into a classroom that has high quality school setting. I take back what I said. I need to ask you about DACA. Sure. We don't know exactly where we are in the fall, late September 2000. And 17, President has said one thing, and I'm not sure exactly where he is right now, but I know what the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, said, 22,000 dreamers in New Jersey, you say? I say they're New Jerseyans. I say they're our students. I say it's our responsibility to be sure that they have access to school, that they have access to resources, and that they continue to be part of the economic vibrancy that they have been for the years that they've been here. We can't send them back? Absolutely to where? not. I mean, where's back? They are Americans. They know America as their home. They know New Jersey as their home. Senator, State Senator Teresa Ruiz is a Democrat. She is the Assistant Majority Leader. And she is, in fact, the chair of the very important, significant Senate Education Committee. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Stay with us. This is State of Affairs. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to welcome Barry Ostrowski, President and CEO, RWJ Barnabas Health. Good to see you, Barry. 
Great to be here. Thanks, Steve. You've talked to us about a whole range of health and related issues on so many of our programs. But on July 27, 2017, a major announcement took place between your organization and Rutgers. Talk about it. Well, I'll tell you, our partnership with Rutgers, which is that which we announced on the 27th, is perhaps the most transformational initiative we as a system has, have ever undertaken. And frankly, I think it's transformational for New Jersey. And we've long been committed to medical education. We've long believed in medical research, but there really hasn't been a vehicle to take this, the state's largest health care system with the State University, which is an internationally renowned educational facility that does research, put it together, combine uh, the strengths of those two organizations, and in fact have a blueprint by which mm -hmm. we can invest in academics and in research, build programs that will cover New Jersey. So for us, it's terrific. I think it's great for the uh, Rutgers University and for the state of New Jersey. You know, you and I were talking about uh, impact right before we got on the air here, and you talked about research. Let me talk about it from an applied perspective, mm -hmm. translation. The impact, the potential impact um, on the health care landscape in the state, and frankly, more importantly, more specifically, the consumers of health care. That's what this is all about. Of course, our mission is to make the lives of the people in New Jersey better. No matter how we can do that, whether it's addressing social determinants or whether it's delivering health care services or whether it is, in fact, discovering new health care services, new techniques. And so medical research is not simply an academic affair. It is, in fact, an attempt to make health care services better, to determine how better to treat people with conditions and illnesses. And, of course, what you just suggested, what is that translational right. process? And so when you put a big delivery system together with a university, a university like Rutgers, you can accelerate the translation of that which you find in a laboratory to the bedside. And it's not inexpensive. It's a commitment. It's an investment. And it's certainly anything but casual. So part of the motivation behind the partnership that we formed is to accelerate this trans, uh, translational research so that it can impact the consumers. Everything we do, candidly, is about the consumer. That is our mission. How do we make your life better, your neighbor's life better, the community in which you live mm. better? Uh, and we think this partnership will enable us to, in fact, attain that goal more easily. You know, put this in a, a, a national perspective, if you could, for us, Barry. There are, there are some university, research-based universities that are actively involved and are branded, dare I use that term, sure. uh, in the healthcare community with other healthcare institutions, and they really stand out. I, I, is this different from that and a New Jersey way, the New Jersey approach to achieving that, or is it totally unique? Well, I, I don't know that it's totally unique, but you and I agree that New Jersey has uh, a, a number of unique characteristics. And the truth is, since we're focused on the people of New Jersey, it has to make sure that it fits comfortably within the New Jersey culture. But I will tell you that the goal here uh, is to make New Jersey a destination for healthcare service, academics, and research. By the time this partnership begins uh, and, frankly, gains the traction we know it will, people will be looking at New Jersey and talking about this partnership in the same paragraphs as, they, as you were to mention, any of the other great nameplates throughout the country. In those cases, they've begun these earlier. Uh, in this case, we're just beginning it now. But New Jersey is, in fact, a place that people will come mm -hmm. in order to get the kind of health care service that they deserve. And they'll be getting it from this partnership of a great university and a great delivery system. You know, as you know, I'm fascinated by uh, questions of leadership and, and organizational communication, et cetera, et cetera, which, and, and I've, uh, to disclose, I've done a fair amount of coaching around leadership and communication with, uh, within the, your system, the system that you lead. Um, but what I'm fascinated by is two very large institutions coming together. Does it look like this? <laughs> or is it, I mean, without getting into the weeds on this, it's a challenge. There's no question Well, worth it, it, but a challenge. It, it's a challenge. Uh, but these are two successful organizations, highly confident in their expertises. 
And that's important. Explain that, so, what that means. So Rutgers understands that it's a wonderful academic organization, has a great track history in all areas of research, and it's confident that it can continue to perform that well and better through this partnership. We're highly confident in our ability to manage healthcare facilities, physicians, to deliver great clinical care, and integrate with our communities. So when two partners get together, each of which is highly confident in what they can do, they have to sit down and decide, if we did it together, would mm -hmm. it make it better? And so we spent months figuring out how putting it together would make it better. And it's trite, but one plus one will make three in this case. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's not easy because we're both very much firmly committed to our pre-existing missions. Now there's a new mission, and we've each subscribed to that enthusiastically, I have to tell you. And I must say, the board of our organization, uh, which is a great board of trustees with incredible insight, uh, has in fact suggested to management that we pursue this in earnest mm -hmm. and do it quickly and effectively. And so there's great enthusiasm around this, but it's going to work because each of us will rely on the skill set that we bring to the partnership. Uh, and I think by further developing that skill set, we're going to get great results. Last question. Uh, we are in Newark. And um, Newark Beth, uh. one of the crown jewels, if you will, of, of, your, uh, of the system, RWJ Barnabas Health System. I know well because members of our family, especially my dad, treated there for many, many years in the heart program, um, heart transplant program. The 1,000th heart transplant has taken place at the Beth. Unbelievable. It's an incredible accomplishment. The Beth is a jewel, certainly in, in any system, and thankfully it's in our system. I was born at the Beth, so I have a particular interest in it. Uh, it developed initially the Great Heart Program in New Jersey and began the first heart transplant program in our state. And as you say, did their 1,000th, which they've already exceeded, heart transplant. If you look across the country, there are only 11 hospitals in the history of the United States that, uh, that have ever exceeded 1,000 heart transplants. And mm. here, one of them is in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, the innovation at the Beth has historically been at the top of the list. And so we're so proud of the professionals and the rank and file and the leadership team there. Uh, for this great milestone, and there'll be more to come. It's a big deal. It, re yeah, it really is a big deal, worthy of celebration. Barry Ostrowski is the uh, president and chief executive officer of RWJ Barnabas Health. We talked about the Rush Record Initiative, Rutgers Partnership and Collaboration, and also the 1000 Heart Transplant. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I am pleased and honored to welcome my colleague at Richard French, host of Richard French live because people people can see it every night. What time? Where? Six o'clock on all FiOS and RNN channels. You and your I love the digs. Right. Well, this is NJTV. I tell you, not bad, right? Very impressive. Now you have an impressive studio too, as well. Um, by the way, tell folks what your show looks like, feels like, because you love and are obsessed by in a healthy way politics and public policy. Well, you know, a little bit of everything. Obviously, uh, you got the president who keeps everybody a little busy. We've got an interesting campaign season, some big social issues going on right now. Uh, so a little bit of regional, a little bit of national. Uh, we also like to include the viewers, um, whether it be some live calls and stuff like that. So it's an hour every night, 6 to 7, Monday through Friday. And uh, no shortage of interesting things to talk about. By the way, where Richard is sitting, sitting right now, we had Lieutenant Governor Kim Gudano and Ambassador Phil Murphy, the two leading candidates um, for governor as a part of a series we're doing simply called New Jersey's Next Governor. It will be actually airing on Fios 1 October 12th at 9 p.m. But let's go back. Talk Trump. What is the biggest concern you have about him and where is his greatest opportunity? On the concern front, uh, forgetting even on the policy, the developments that were unfolding as it relates to the investigation 
uh, the no-knock warrants uh, for Paul Manafort that we're learning about, uh, the clear intent on the investigation uh, to literally treat this almost like a mob case. Um, there is no shortage of seriousness or consequences potentially for an administration that hasn't seemed to handle adversity or um, confusion well. And I think that this is going to uh, put even further pressures, and I don't know what will happen as a consequence out of it. So you have that parallel going on with, uh, obviously, international incidents. Um, you have, obviously, major issues, whether it do in terms of budgetary or debt limits, and now on top of that. Or DACA, certainly. And I know you've spoken to a lot of folks as I would be directly impacted by that. And uncertainty, again, is something that uh, we can talk about in political terms, but it's real-life issues for those folks. And similarly for health care, health care reform right now, what will and won't happen with a repeal even if they find the vote. So there's a lot of moving parts to it. It's hard for any administration, but with the cloud of controversy um, and possible indictments coming down, it makes it even that much harder. Let's talk political discourse. Trump's part of that. One of the things I always uh, have loved about your show is that it's civil. People disagree, but it's always respectful. It's not so disagreeable in the sense of tone and tenor. Long-winded question, I know, Rich. What reason do you have to be optimistic about the level and the tone of political discourse in our country and the ability to actually talk about things without calling each other names? You're the enemy. You're not with me. I've got to try to hurt you. You know what I'm talking about. It sounds simple, but I don't think it can get any worse. So. I think whoever follows, whether it be in three years and seven years or whatever time in between, as the next president, I think, regardless of your politics, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or whatever, <coughs> will in all likelihood, because we've never seen anything like this before, be more traditional and more uh, less adversarial. They won't use Twitter as a weapon at two in the morning. Um, and the caustic nature that we've seen, I mean, something as simple as that gift where he's hitting a golf ball off of the back of Hillary's head going up a tarmac. You know, some people will laugh, but some people will say, this is the president. This is the office of the presidency. He says this is his greatest tool to connect with the American people. And he maybe said. it is. And maybe he has direct connectivity and there's no filter. But I think there's been a consequence that. We've seen Charlottesville. We've seen other things. It's a complicated question. It's a complicated answer. I just believe, regardless of a Republican or Democrat, whoever follows him into office, I think the temperature will be lowered, or at least that's my hope. So you've been in the media for a few years. Uh, I've been there with you. I say fake news. You say? I don't know what that means anymore. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I find people we meet in our personal lives, let alone professional lives, they're so stratified where you can now live in your own independent world um, regardless of reality. If you want to go to certain sites that will either feed conspiracy theories, feed only one specific political thought, disregard facts entirely and just live that way, you can do that now. I think at your detriment. I mean, I always tell this example. My late grandfather was a bus driver. But he would never get on that bus in the morning mm. unless he read two or three papers. And they weren't all right, they weren't all left, but he wanted to know what's going on because he would feel like an idiot if he opened his mouth to say something that was uninformed. Today? Today, you take pride almost, some people, in saying, it's how I feel, it's my gut. Well, what about the facts? Exactly. What about the facts? I, so it's a hard question to answer what's fake news and what isn't. Where's I just our think role, it's though, a need You try and inform. Um, I think people will always describe a particular motive, whether it's fair or not. And unfortunately, you just hope that people can weigh enough information. I think part of it's consumption models. You know that. Mm. Uh, people like to get things in a certain amount of characters right. or in less than two minutes, and you can't get context with that. By the way, uh, our show, the New, next, New Jersey's Next Governor show, so many insightful, smart questions. Talk about meaningful discourse. Uh, so many insightful questions came from Fios One and, and the website and your partner, our partners, uh, together with Rich and his team. Why does this race in New Jersey matter nationally? It's one of only two in the nation with uh, Virginia, right? It is. Um, I think people sometimes overread trend lines. We've seen that in a lot of races sure. we followed where there isn't a domino that will follow after this. But I think in a state which is, well, the, as you know, as well as anybody, you've got registration more blue than red, but not dramatically so. 
I think whatever the margin that turns out for this race will be wake-up calls, whether it be at the RNC or the DNC, and also some of the language. Yes, Murphy's an, an outsider, if you will, but kind of, sort of. I mean, he certainly is an accomplished person in the business world. He was an ambassador before that. He has a lot of connections that you know very well within the Garden State. But yet he's not coming from a traditional route. And Lieutenant Governor? Lieutenant Governor, um, uh, to me, the narrative that I'd love somebody to explain to me is she has been a loyal soul soldier for this governor. And I must have missed outreach or efforts. And I know the poll numbers would say maybe he's more of a, an anchor than a benefit, but there's been so little efforting done to advance. And I'll give a small example. Real quick, a few seconds. Right. We go on that walk to Washington. Throw the lieutenant governor a bone. Let her be the star of the event. You know, I, I just think that she hasn't been served well. Rich French, you can catch him every night. What time? Six o'clock. Where? Files One News, New Jersey. You also got it on RNN on every system. Thank you, partner. Thank you very much. Well I appreciate done. it. You appreciate should. It. That was great. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by New Jersey Sharing Network, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, JAG Physical Therapy, Georgian Court University. Valley National Bank, Verizon, and by Fedway Associates. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.